now I guess we'll go ahead and get started. On the back of your handout today from the church back there, our missionaries of the week are Jim and Rhonda Shaw. Boy, you talk about supporting somebody a long time. We've supported them since September of 1985. I think our longest support for our missionary is our missionaries in South Africa. But this just by a few months. This is 37 years that we've supported Jim and Rhonda, and most of that time they have been uh, establishing the Bella Vista Baptist Church, a number of correspondence schools, three seminaries, just tremendous work there, longitudinal work, staying a long time. We belonged to a country club where we played golf when I was growing up called Bella Vista. It means beautiful land or beautiful view in Italian. This isn't Italian because it's Brazil. They speak Portuguese, but it's similar. It's just a beautiful country, and it's a large country, a, a country that needs to be reached for Christ, and they're doing a good work. And unless you plan on going over there, let's give to Faith Promise Missions and support people like Jim and Rhonda Shaw. And our church has supported them again, coming up 37 years in September. That's wonderful. That's longer than almost all of us have been here. We'll go to the book of Ruth today. We're in a new series called Exploring People of the Bible. I believe there are 52 lessons in this. Don't worry, we'll break them up. We'll do about 10 people. Then we might do a book study or a practical study, and then we'll do more. But we've done this twice. We've taught this good series based on the books of Dr. John Philip exploring the people of the Bible uh, several times. We've been pottering around in the book of Ruth the last few weeks, and we're going to actually study Ruth herself today. The title of the lesson is Ruth, a Pagan Seeker. And we're going to begin in Ruth chapter 1, verse 4 in just a minute. You've been with us the last few weeks. You know that Ruth was a Moabitess, and Ammon and Moab were a cursed race because they were products of incest, which is, of course, a horrible sin. She had been born and bred in paganism. The gods of her people were horrible gods, murderous gods. Uh, the Cunninghams are our missionaries to Bali. They told me a bunch of the wickedness of the gods, the little g gods of the people in Bali, and they're just projections of human wickedness into the sky. When Ruth was a little girl, she remembers lots of whispering and fear and hiding and tones hushed on the voices of her parents and uh, eyes watchful and face grave. She knew something bad was going on. You know, children are little. They haven't learned yet. Like uh, a coal miner's daughter, they may be ignorant, but they're not stupid. They have not heard about everything, but they know something bad is going on. And she, when she was a little girl in Moab, could tell her parents were afraid, and they were afraid of the priest. The priests were the enemy of little boys, and the priests were the enemies of little girls. The priests were powerful and cruel, and they served an assortment of gods. We've studied before that the main god, the main wicked god of Moab was Chemosh, also called Molech. And a great uh, movement to satisfy the wicked god Chemosh, anything that happened in that nation or that society, they thought perhaps it might be cured by sacrificing a young boy on the altar of Moloch uh, to the god of the underworld. They would take a little living baby and throw it on a red hot fire and roll it into the mouth of stone set up to represent an idol for the uh, god Chemosh or the god Moloch. Uh, as an inclined plane, the people would cheer. They would think that they had been saved by the, de by the desire to kill a young boy. Also, uh, not only would they be found, uh, but years before, they might be marked out for future service. They'd come into the village. They'd see a young boy, and they would take a red dye that was an indelible dye that could not be removed and mark the wrist of that young boy, and that young boy would operate and live under the curse of death because no court in the land of Moab could overturn an ink mark placed by a priest. Death was to be marked on that little child. So when Ruth was old enough and played with the other little girls, she learned another part of their worship of false gods. There was also in Moab a fertility god. If you wanted there to be crops that would succeed in the field, you needed to sacrifice to the pagans' gods in the fertility temple in Moab, which was basically a temple prostitution. It was just absolute wickedness. As, as it was with the wicked priests, they'd watch for the firstborn boys to offer up to the flames of Chemosh. 
They'd also watch for little girls to be pressed into the surface as a prostitute in the temple a service of the fertility God. So there was wickedness on the right hand or the left. There were threats to the little boys and the little girl. It was a nation cursed because it was worshiping the wrong gods who were not gods but were demons. So growing up, Ruth would be doubly frightened, not only by the burning fires of the smoking altar of Chemosh, but also by being pressed into absolute death and wickedness as a fertility prostitute goddess. That's the idea. Uh, this is the woman around whom the story of the book of Ruth came from. When you come to me and say, well, I had a bad background. No, you didn't. Ruth had a bad background. Everybody, in a sense, has a background. Don't ever use that as an excuse not to come to God, to follow God, to walk with God, because you, you'll be outranked in the Bible every time. She came from a horrible nation and a horrible situation that rejected the God of heaven and worshiped demon gods in a very practical way. This account today, this uh, story of Ruth that we've been in the last few weeks, tells how Ruth came to know the living God, the one and true God of heaven, and entered into the, a relationship with him and into the family of him uh, through the act, the redemptive act of a kinsman redeemer. She was born hopelessly lost in a nation that was cursed by God. There was no way legally, religiously, morally, or righteously that she could come to God. God made a way to be both the just and the justifier of all that come to him. And he did that for Ruth. Uh, when we first meet Ruth here in Ruth chapter 1, she is as lost as a snake in high grass. There was no chance of her getting unlost God had made sure that the Mosaic law said no Moabite could have any part of any ceremony in God's temple under the 10th generation. The bottom line, Ruth couldn't be saved. Her son couldn't be saved. Her grandson couldn't be saved all the way down to the 10th generation. What she lost, she was more than lost. She was hopelessly lost and roadblocks were placed there by the God of heaven to keep her and her kind away from his people. That's the idea. Between her and any hope of salvation lay the entire woe and weight of the law of Sinai from the God of heaven. With implacable degrees and demands, there is no way she could escape these edicts that had come down from Sinai. So the book of Ruth takes somebody to, with whom there's no hope and shows you how God made a way for her to come to him. You may have been raised in a Christian home. I wasn't. Uh, not at all. I wasn't raised in a wicked home. I was just raised, ra raised in a lost home. And when I understood about the God of heaven, I thought that too, that there's no way that I can come to that. I remember taking my sister to a service at Bellevue Baptist Church, and she's just a normal person with all tangled up life like everybody else. And she said, I, I can't come here. This is wrong. This is, I'm, this is not for somebody like me. And she still hasn't gotten saved to this day. So this is a frightening thing. The God of heaven working in time and space and history, uh, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ has made a way that we today, despite our background and our wickedness, can have our sins transferred off of our back and onto the account of the Lord Jesus Christ, carried away to the cross, buried forever, uh, sins taken as far as the east is from the west. This Old Testament illustration illustrates New Testament truth with a true Old Testament story. Uh, a stranger, Ruth, to the commonwealth of Israel, a dweller in a pagan land, somebody by the decree of God banned from the ceremonies and the worship of the God of heaven, is brought by a kinsman redeemer, somebody who stood in her place, into a covenantal and enduring relationship with the God of Israel. How God not only adopted Ruth into his family into the, and into the royal family of Judah, but uh, in the outworkings of his grace, he put her into a direct line with David, David's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the line of the seed. And we talk about the little book of Ruth. You know, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then Joshua judges Ruth. Just a little book. The only thing little about Ruth is the, is the length of it. It is a major book as far as what it says. If any book of the Bible illustrates New Testament grace in an Old Testament story, it's the book of Ruth. And it's a, a, a divine plan of redemption that God was carried out 
Long before Ruth was born, he had her eye on her from the day she came forth and was saved. You know, we study in the Old Testament two aspects of the redemption of God. Number one, redemption by power. We study that in Exodus when Moses takes out the children of Israel across an ocean bed that's suddenly and completely dry. We have no machine, we have no ship, no, we have no power at all to split the ocean and to do that. That is redemption by power. This is redemption by purchase. He makes a purchase that cost him a great deal and it ends up with Ruth being redeemed and having a free run into the family of God. Number one, this story of Ruth, redemption by purchase. Let's talk about Ruth and the sovereignty of God. This means a lot to me because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't think God existed, much less had any interest to in me. Looking back now, 40 years later, he did. Thank God he did. Number one, Ruth and the sovereignty of God. Mark this, long before uh, Ruth knew anything about God, God knew everything about her. You understand that, don't you? You know about the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of God, the attributes of deity. That spans not only geography across the oceans, around the world. It spans history, both backward and forward. God knew her name. He knew where she lived. He knew the man that she married and was going to marry. He knew the name of her husband, Malon. He knew her heart desires. And long before Ruth made any move toward coming toward God, God made tremendous moves coming toward her. And a series of events occurred which were designed to and did bring her face to face with Boaz, the man that was to redeem her. God's plan in the Old Testament in this story of earthly redemption is an illustration of God's plan spiritually in our life of eternal redemption. His plan was that this woman was to meet and wed and be welded to Boaz, a kinsman redeemer, who could take her out of the cursed position of a woman Moabite, uh, Moabitess into the privileged position of someone who married into and is now part of uh, God's people in the Old Testament. His plan was to give her heart and life to Boaz, and, he, and she did this, and he was the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament in a beautiful, real, picture book kind of way. The Bible says that things in the Old Testament were written for our admonition and instruction. Don't ever skip over the Old Testament. You'll always see in type, in shadow, or in picture the work or the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and never more than in this book of Ruth. Number one, Regarding Ruth and the sovereignty of God, there was drought and there was a famine. Look in chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Here's the first link that was going to link Ruth to Boaz. It was a sovereign act of God over which she had no control. A little baby in a crib certainly had no premonition that this was about to happen. Even a young girl who was going to go off into another land, she had no idea. She was going to follow her husband. That was the idea. Uh, this was a famine in the foreign country of Judah. Thirteen famines mentioned in the Bible. Probably Ruth knew nothing in the, about this famine, and if she did, she was glad it was in the land of Judah and not in the land of Moab. Moab would have looked with smug satisfaction on any famine in the land of Judah because they hated the people of Judah and the people of Judah despised them. It was a good racial hatred. That's not new despite what you see on television. That's just the human race. People have every excuse and take any excuse to hate one another. It was far away, Ruth in Moab thought, about this famine in Judah and it wouldn't affect her. Guess what? It's like that in our redemption too. Long before we come to know God, he initiates a chain of circumstances that will bring us face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. I was born in January 1961 in Methodist Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. I lived in Memphis till I was 14. My dad got a new job. We lived in Missouri for 10 years. And uh, after seven of those years, I came back to Memphis to go to medical school. That was in the summer of 82. 
and I had no idea. I went, was going back to Memphis because that is where I got accepted into medical school. I also got accepted into a, a school in Missouri and a school in Texas, but I thought, well, I'll go to the one in Tennessee. So far, so good. You know, you got to go where they take you. It's nice to be wanted. Uh, but I was a clever little person. I was a lost person, and I was absolutely convinced that I was one of the most clever people that I had personally ever met. And I mean, I was just very stunned with myself. And I wasn't going to listen to anything that a preacher said because I didn't think they were that bright. I thought they were kind of dim bulbs. And God put me on a third-year rotation in dermatology at the VA Medical Center, one block from Bellevue Baptist Church, where Adrian Rogers had the men's Bible study every Thursday. And you could eat there for $3, and it was all you could eat. And I was broke, and I was hungry. And that's where my friends wisely said, why don't you go with us for $3? You can eat enough, you'll explode. And you don't even have to listen to the talk. Well, it was just like a fish being drawn into a net. The one man that after five minutes, I thought, this guy's a lot smarter than me, a lot smarter. Now, don't wait to think that you're smart or dumb or anything. That has nothing to do with being saved. That was just the plan God had moving me all around the country throughout the Midwest for 10 years, brought me back, brought me to that school, brought me to the third year rotation, brought me to the, I could have done that somewhere else, but I did it at the VA. Literally, you could see it. It would be like going to Weigel's from here. And I walked over there and God put me in the live box and said, it's mine, gotcha. And you know what? Within four or five months, God saved me. He absolutely deconstructed my false reasons for not getting saved. He said, smart. He said, you're about the dumbest thing I ever saw, but I love you, and I'm going to bring you home. And I thought, boy, it just changed me in a few months. God did that. Often these circumstances, you plug your story in. I told that story because it's the only story I have. Often these circumstances are arranged before we are born. They're true in my life. I imagine that true in your life. This happened. That happened. We moved here, but we almost moved there. I went to school here, but I could have gone to school there. And God was just weaving and threading, and the, the, the angles were coming in, and all of a sudden it all comes together. And God says, this is the place, this is the time. Now I'm going to reveal myself to you in my way, and you're going to come to me. He can't, he's not going to force me, but he's going to absolutely cut the legs out from under me and reel me in. At a time it never occurred to you or to me that these unfolding circumstances had anything to do with our coming to Christ, but the retrospect, retrospectroscope is clear. You look back and it's all clear. That's the nice thing about getting older. You see God's hand in all these things much clearer. Number one, a drought brought Ruth into position, a famine. Number two, discovery, a family. Out of that drought, here comes a family moving into Ruth's life from Judah to Moab, a family that believed in the one true God of heaven. They weren't spiritual giants. Well, good, because we're not either. God may use you when you're not the most spiritual person in the world, but you're a Christian to be the only object and route of truth in somebody's life that you move next door to. Ruth never met anybody like this family. She liked them. She liked the mother. She liked the two children the two sons, and she may have noticed that Elimelech and Naomi were not too happy with their boys being friends with girls like her. She was a nice enough girl, but she was a pagan girl, and they made it clear they didn't think much of her religion, and they didn't want their teenage boys getting involved with that kind of girl. Well, of course, the boys didn't really care about that, and they said, you know, Mom and Dad don't like you. They think you're pagans. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, uh, you might steal us away. You know what? They did. <laughs> they got married to the pagan girls there in the pagan land. Uh, as time passed, Ruth became well acquainted with the family. And the supper time talks and the after supper talks turned to the things of God. Ruth was not a rocket scientist. She wasn't a Bible scholar. But she was the best Bible scholar probably in that area. And the only one that uh, Ruth knew of. Elimelech was a backslider, but he was a believer. He wouldn't sacrifice children. He may not have lived for the Lord and trusted him and stayed down in Judah like we wanted him to. Ruth was a sharp girl. She had questions about this, about the God of heaven, about the nation of Israel, about the plan of God. And you know what? They knew the answers to these things. They talked to her about Abraham and Isaac 
and Jacob. They talked to her about Joseph and the Exodus and the Passover lamb. They talked to her about the wilderness wanderings. They talked to her about why Moab was cursed, why Ammon was cursed. They sang the songs of Deborah and of Moses and of Psalm 90. And Ruth drank it in. I did that too, I remember. I went to college in 1978 and I was a, lived in a fraternity house and I was 17 years old and I had no business being there. I don't know how in the world my parents got me there. But even then God was after me and I would get up and go to this Methodist church about 10 miles from where I live and I'd go there every Sunday and I would listen to every word they said. I wasn't saved at that time, but I thought this is right. And uh, I was reading C.S. Lewis and some books like that that took me out of atheism into believing in God. It didn't come, and then believing that Christ was real, I still didn't make a saving confession or a faith in Christ. But he was working on me. Ruth was being worked on. She heard about this. She heard about the one true God of heaven, a kind God as opposed to the gods of Moab, a holy God, a pure God, completely unlike the dreadful lustful, savage gods of her people. And she was thrilled to know that there was an alternative to the pure evil and wickedness that was extant in her land. She didn't make a life commitment yet. She didn't make a, a heart salvation in the provision of God to come. But she was intensely and immensely attracted to that God and to just the same. Number three, not only was there a drought and a discovery not only a family that she met, but there was death and there was a funeral. You say, oh, that's too bad. That is too bad, but understand this, that was the part of God. God was bringing Ruth to somebody that would break down the walls between the worship uh, of her and the true God of heaven, and that man was Boaz. Too bad for Malon. I trust he was just a backslider, and we'll see him in heaven. But he had to go. <laughs> God's got big plans to bring her to himself. Uh, tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. Three funerals, three caskets, three weeping widows. That's bad. You have years like that. Some years everything go well and then everything hits at one time and you have tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Elimelech, gone. Malon, gone. Chilion, gone. Three widow women, standing there, one a Moabitess, two a Moabitess, and the other one uh, shouldn't have been there in the first place, and she was going to go back soon. Three cold graves, three weeping widows out of God's position in the land of Moab, all of their mingling their tears together. Casket goes in the ground, the dirt goes on top, and it's so sad and it hurts so bad and death is so horrible and the ache and the loss seem so unfair. She could have become like Naomi. Remember Naomi was pleasant, but she said, call me Mara. I'm bitter. Don't call me pleasant. She was a hard, mean woman for a long time after what she'd gone through. Ruth could have done the same thing. Guess what? She did not. The God of heaven was working on her heart through all of these good circumstances and bad circumstances. She didn't fall into that pit. You know why? Because she had learned about the God of heaven from her new neighbors and her new friends and her mother-in-law. She had learned that God is too loving to be unkind, too wise to make any mistakes, and too powerful to be thwarted in his plans. The death of Ruth's husband was planned by the God of life and death as part of the plan to bring Ruth to himself. She would come to himself only by a kinsman redeemer, the one that could break down the barriers, and she marrying him would now be part of the family of Israel and could approach the God of heaven. She was going to come by Boaz and no other. He say, well, I believe in the big guy in the sky. I wouldn't. He doesn't exist. God of heaven is not the big guy in the sky. You come to Christ and you come by Christ or you don't come to God at all. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In that day, there was one mediator between Ruth and the God of heaven and that mediator was Boaz. It's a picture, it's just an earthly picture of spiritually what you and I have gone through. The death of Ruth's husband was part of the plan 
let's be frank, Malon had to die. And a lot of times to do things in our life that need to be done to bring friends to Christ or families to Christ or you to Christ, good things have to happen from an earthly point of view and sometimes bad things are allowed to happen by God. He doesn't cause bad things. He didn't bring death into this world, but the death's here now and the timing of it and the arrangement of it may be part of his plan to bring us to him in Israel. Redemption by a kinsman redeemer and to bring her out of paganism and into the family of God was going to be accomplished by her marriage to Boaz. And obviously he couldn't marry her if she were still married to Malon. So the sad fact of Malon's death was still under the umbrella of an overarching and all-controlling God. Part of his sovereign grace to Ruth's soul. You say, boy, that's rough. You know why? We're not God. That does sound rough, humanly speaking. Don't be like Job and God will have to say, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? I think I know what I'm doing. It's not my first rodeo. Yes, sir. That's what, exactly what you'll say. It's, uh, he, God planned Malon's funeral out of the kindness of his heart toward Ruth. And years later, Ruth could look back on these terrible days, that horrible year when three people died, three husbands gone, and say, God was doing a deep, hard work in our life, and it was necessary. She was now, years later, uh, married to that wonderful, mighty prince of the house of Jacob and living in the promised land, and she could say, I'll bless the hand that guided, I'll bless the heart that planned, when, thro I, when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. That's a wonderful song, the when and the where. Finally, not only the death, a funeral that was part of God's hard tough plan to bring her to himself but dismay there was a fear you know what the fear was the fear was when uh, Naomi came and said girls I've been wrong I hear there's revival back in the land of Bethlehem Judah I'm going back and you know what <laughs> Naomi wasn't any spiritual giant she thought I'm, I don't know if I want to drag along two Moabite girls that's not going to help me get a very good welcome back there in Bethlehem Judah and I may be almost too old for a husband but I might like one and I don't need these pagan girls cluttering me up she said I'm going back because God has visited his people there was a revival there in Bethlehem Judah no more backsliding for Naomi in Moab, she was going back where she was from, where God met with his people. She was going home and intended and did to resume fellowship with the God of heaven and the people of the God of heaven. Well, what about Ruth? I don't think Naomi was thinking that much about Ruth, and not that she didn't like her, but she had bigger fish to fry. For Ruth, this is an absolute disaster. You remember how those that walked with Christ were just absolutely scattered after Christ died, and they never understood until he came back that he was going to rise again. Remember in uh, Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus and the two, uh, Cleopas and the other disciple, when Jesus vanished, they thought, where is he now? What's going on? Ruth was going to receive this information about Naomi with considerable dismay. The only light she knew, which wasn't a perfect light, but any kind of light shines pretty, pretty brightly in absolute darkness, was leaving. It was a dim light. It had a garbled testimony of a confused backslider, but it was light. Considered in the light of Moab, it was crystal clear light. And so now, with Naomi leaving and her only link to that God she thought leaving, all Ruth could see was a meaningless future in Moab where she didn't fit, and it was pure evil. All she knew of God was wrapped up in the person of Naomi, and now Naomi was headed back to the land of Judah. And for now, for Ruth, this was going to be an emptiness greater than her husband's death. It's terrible to lose your husband, but it's worse to lose your only link with the only God that made any sense, that had any light in Ruth's life. Uh, this would be an emptiness, like I said, greater than that of her husband's death. The future, a dark and dismal stretch before her. You know what her future was, it looked like? Moabite gods, Moabite gloom, Moabite goals, Moabite grave. In Jefferson County, we used to have a paper registration forms at the old hospital behind Carson Newman, and they had your name, your address, and a little box at the bottom that said religion. And it would say this, that, and the last box said 
none, uh, zero, none, Baptist, or other. That's what you check. Because in Jefferson County, you're assumed to be born Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when you die, you're Baptist dead. Well, they were going to be the same way here. She thought, all I've got is Moabite gods, Moabite gloom, Moabite goals, and Moabite grave. She couldn't stand that. She said, I'm going to do something. You know what? There's sometimes in your life you need to make a plan. You need to do something. You say, I'm going to let go and let God. Okay, you know what God wants you to do? Do something. Three, not only Ruth and the sovereignty of God, Ruth and the salvation of God. Ruth and Orpah made the same decisions initially. They said, we're going to go with Naomi. Look in Ruth chapter 1, verse 7. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughter-in-laws were with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So far, so good. Maybe you're at a meeting. Maybe they say, if you want to trust Christ, come down and talk to a counselor, and you can get saved in your seat, but there's nothing wrong with coming down talking to a counselor. And the girl next to you says, if you go, I'll go. And you know what? They both got up and went, and that's perfectly good. But man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. When we get to the end of the story, we find out that two people went with Naomi back to Judah, at least part of the way, but only one had a new heart. Only one made a heart commitment to the God of that land to which they were headed. Thousands of times you see that. I've done it, and you have to watch very carefully. High pressure, emotional excitement. Uh, urging of friends that's good and fine and there's nothing wrong with walking an aisle and most people that do are saved and you should let the redeemed of the Lord say so and let the people rejoice but sometimes people will go down and they'll become a mouth professor but they won't be a heart possessor there'll be no new life and you don't know that but you can look back decades later perhaps and see that that was what was going on you can sign a card, and you should sign a card. You can get baptized, and you should get baptized. You can join the church. But sometimes it's just an intellectual move. It's a mouth profession without heart possession. Sometimes it could be emotional or impulsive. We can't assume that everybody that makes a mouth profession has heart possession. We hope they do, and sometimes they are. But you can't do that. You have to wait and see. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you know what else it says? The next verse in Ephesians 2, 2 10 says, uh, Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. The same people that God saves by grace are saved unto works that flow from the new life they have. You're not saved by works, but the works have their place. Works follow. A new heart follows. More importantly, you say, I don't know about that. Well, it's very important. Uh, if, the, you're, if whatever religion you got by walking some aisle 10 years ago, if it's the kind of religion that didn't change your life, you better change your religion. The one where Jesus Christ comes in to live inside you, good, bad, or otherwise, is going to change you. You're not saved by being changed. You're changed when you are saved. It's got to be so. We studied that in 1 John, the birthmarks of the believer. You remember those, those five birthmarks. Anyway, so far, so good. Jesus says the same thing. We studied about the four soils not long ago. There's a hard soil where the, where the seed springs up, and it looks like it's real active, and then it dies. And there's no enduring fruit, and there's no enduring life. That's the idea. The apostle warned about this in Hebrews 1, 6. John spoke of it in 1 John 2. Hebrews 6, 1 says, let us go on. Living faith is alive. It moves. I used to try to save people $75 for when I pronounced people when I was a medical examiner. You, instead of me going over to the emergency room and they bring that body in there and they charged them $75 who knows what they would charge now this 20 or 30 years ago I'd say just bring that hearse around back behind my office and I'll crawl in there and check their you know make sure they're dead or not well how do you check if somebody's dead well you listen to their heart and their lungs you take a pencil and really crack that finger where they would jump if there was anything you take your hand and knuckle right there uh, you take a little we all had a little mirror you'd put under the nose, see if it'd fog up. When you're alive, you move. 
Your heart moves, your lung moves, something moves. You say, well, that's great. We'll just move their arms and legs around and they'll come back to life. No, I didn't say movement makes you alive. I said living things move. That's the idea. Living faith goes on. You're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Uh, we are his workmanship and actions occur. So we watch what happens to Ruth and to Orpah, and uh, it's sobering and instructive. As they walked, Naomi began to doubt. She said, I'm dragging these two pagan girls in. Nobody's going to talk to me. These are bad news. Uh, girls, I don't think there's any Moabite men where we're going. You might not have uh, much of a social life. Why don't you just stay here with the good old guys in Moab? Way to go, Naomi. You're giving them bad advice. Orpah said, you know, I'm thinking the same thing. I'm not sure I'm going to fit in with this Judah crowd down there, this God of heaven crowd. Uh, you know what, Naomi? You're right. Good advice. It's Moab for me. My good old pals, my good old friends, I'll stay down here. Just good old Moab boys. That's what I like. That's what I'm looking for. And with tears and cri uh, cries and weeping, Orpah turns back, the two watch her head off, back to Moab, back to demon gods, back to the old way of life, back to a godless eternity, and as far as we know, back to lost forever. That's the idea. She was roused. She was interested. She sprung forth in a little burst of interest, and then it all withered up and died. Uh, they turned back, dead, stopped back to their old lives, back to their old gods, back to a user-friendly local religion, the good old boys and the good old girls. They weren't saved and lost. They had never received new life through faith in God and his provision. They had been what the book of Hebrews called enlightened, and they had tasted of the things to come, but they did not have the things that accompany salvation. No new life, no new heart desires. It was just a flash in the pan. They never finished the deal. They fell back. They fell away. And they proved, as uh, Peter said to Simon Magus, remember the, the one that played the, the magic tricks on everybody, that they had neither part nor lot in this matter, and their hearts were not right in the sight of God. That's in Acts 8.21. In uh, 1 John, what is it, 2.16, I think, it says they went out from among us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have doubtless continued with us, but they went out from among us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. You, you don't, you're not somebody's judge, but after 10 years of not a bit of change or 20 years of no new life, you've sure got a suspicion, and that person would certainly know. It is a sobering, damning possibility that you can make a mouth profession and have no heart possession of Christ his death for us or his new life. Second Peter 1.10 says to make your calling and election sure. And how is that? Let us go on, he said. So Orpah turned back to Moab. Slowly, slowly she drew away from the other women. She set her face, un unfortunately, toward the city of destruction from which she came. But this is a human tragedy too. They loved each other. It's, it's tears. It's a little wave of the hand. It's a dip in the road. It's a crest in the hill, and suddenly she's gone. You ever taken somebody to the train or the airport that you're not sure you're ever going to see them again? And they'll wave out that window, and then they're gone. That hurts. That is really rough. As for Ruth, she clung to Naomi, her link to the new life, to the new God. And although she didn't know it, uh, the new kinsman redeemer, Boab. Back Boaz, back to Moab, no way. Naomi wasn't sure. Look in verse 15. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back to her people and unto her gods. Why don't you return after her too? Listen to what Ruth said in verse 16. She said, Entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou die, I'll die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so also, if aught but death part thee and me. You know, that's read at weddings, and it's appropriate, even though it's out of context. The context is a woman and her mother-in-law. And that shows you the depth of love you can have even outside of marriage. It's perfectly appropriate for marriage. That's how men and women should feel about each other, that, that 
that, that your life is their life and, and they're, you're going to live with them till you die and you're going to love and serve them and they're going to love and serve you. But this was Ruth's heart, the depths of Ruth's heart, to go back with Naomi to the house of Bethlehem, Judah. That's the idea. Not only a roused soul, but a redeemed soul. Finally, a redeemed soul. Ruth turned out better. Ruth met the redeemer. In this case, humanly speaking, Boaz. In our case, the Lord Jesus Christ. Two widows back in Bethlehem, not much money, renting a little apartment on the backside of nowhere. Naomi was old, but Ruth was tough. She said, hey, we're not going to sit here and starve. I'm young. I'm going to work. And the Hebrew social security system was called the gleaning. When you had a field, you cut the corners. You didn't cut them out to the very end. You left some on the edges of the field for anybody that wanted to get out there and go and harvest that corn or whatever it was could have food. And Ruth got right up and she got her work clothes on and she said, I'm going to go out and get us some food. And I'm sure Naomi said, well, bless you. Uh, that's the idea. All that she gleaned was going to be hers. For early morning, first light, Ruth's off to the field. She happens to pick a portion that belongs to Boaz. I'm using happens uh, in a, a silly s sense right there. It wasn't random chance. She didn't know where Boaz's field was. God directed her feet to the field where her redeemer was active. Ruth meets Boaz. He likes her. She's a very attractive girl, and she's got apparently a real go-getters type spirit. He said, welcome to my field. Look in chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, she fell on her face and bowed herself unto the ground and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, and thou should take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? He gave her the best part of the field. He made sure that she had triple what everybody else had. He said, go to the third row on the left, and I think and there was a bonanza there, just tons of food. He was very good to her. She, according to Ruth 10, 2, immediately recognized that this man was extending grace in the eyes of someone that was going to turn out to be a kinsman redeemer. God had wonderfully and wisely directed her steps to exactly the one she needed to know. It's exactly like when I was over there at that VA medical center doing that dermatology rotation. I had this Jewish medical student from Israel. I don't know what he was an exchange student. And he, he wasn't a Christian. He was a Hebrew man. He was a very nice man. And he said, you ought to go to that. He said, I may go too. I mean, God was working just to, to get me into the right place, and he did the same with Ruth. Things move quickly after this. Uh, they do when it's real and when God's involved. In Ruth chapter 2, she's in Boaz's field. In Ruth chapter 3, she is at Boaz's feet, curled up there right by him. And Ruth chapter 4, she's got a ring on her finger and she's in Boaz's family. My wife and I met in the summer of 1984 in August. And we were engaged in November. And there was a ring on her finger in January. And we were married in April. We were slow compared to Ruth and Boaz. They were like, Shazam, this is the one. <laughs> and it worked out wonderfully, absolutely wonderfully. Ruth ended up marrying Boaz. But even back on this first day, Naomi knew how much grain you could get gleaning. And Ruth had a way bunch more. You know what about old women? They've been around the block. They know what's going on. Immediately they go, tell me what happened today. Who did you meet? I met a very nice man named Boaz. Boaz. Boaz is your kinsman. And he can be, if you marry him, a kinsman redeemer. And you can be brought into the family of God through a relationship with Boaz. And Ruth, you know, young, young women don't get it for all, but older women, they got They think, I'm going to make this work. She says, first thing, you get back there, get all cleaned up, comb your hair, we're going to get you a new outfit. This is your man. You've got to make sure. And, she, and Ruth, of course, she said, fine, I think he's great. They did this. Naomi couldn't believe it. No gleaner ever got a hoe like that. Did you steal it? No, I didn't steal it. I met a man who was kind to me, mother, mother-in-law. His name was Boaz. The light dawns. He's a near kinsman. He can redeem you. He can put you into the family of Israel, into the family of God. Girl, if you ever weren't shy, don't be shy now. Go after this man. Go to him. He's the right one for you. Get close to him. Stay at his feet. Marry him. Ask him to marry you. 
That's the right kind of girl. Ruth did exactly that. What would you say? Oh, my back hurts after a hard day. Oh, those men drive me crazy. Well, of course they do, but you, this is the different man. This is Boaz. This is somebody that is very, very important. You say, well, I'm not worthy. Nobody's worthy. You say, well, I've got a history. Everybody's got a history. That's not a, a, a full stop mode for anybody's plan, uh, either in, on earth or in heaven. What would people say? People that care uh, don't say anything. People that say things uh, that, that they, they don't care. It just, who cares what people say? People are going to yap about everything. Just do what's right. Go to the one. This is the one. I'm from the wrong kind of family. Everybody of Adam's ruined race is from the wrong kind of family. God's made provision through a kinsman redeemer, and he wouldn't have made provision unless we were to use it. Ruth went straight to Boaz and pretty quick uh, had him asking her to make her his own. And he did, and he made her his own, if you studied the, the story, at great price. He had to work very carefully and use a lot of his resources and buy her out of this terrible situation from even another uh, member of the family who was uh, very tight with his money and he was able to trick him. This was at great price at great cost to himself as Ephesians 2 says for the great love wherewith he loved her and that's what Christ did for us at great cost for people that didn't deserve it Christ purchased our salvation at great cost to one that came from a bad family that was completely outlawed from the worship of the God of heaven Boaz brought her in and not only did he bring her in they had a child, Obed, and a grandchild, David, and a great-great-grandchild, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God going there. That's exactly what I'm going to do, working thousands of things through hundreds of combinations and permutations, and in his sovereignty, Ruth wins, Boaz wins, Christ is coming, Son of Man, Redeemer, Great love. So Orpah stayed in darkness and lost. Ruth married Boaz and was now no longer an outcast, but wedded and welded to a mighty prince of the house of Judah. She was now joint heir with him. They had all things in common, dwelling with him. Question, which will you choose? The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. You want to stay with your Moab life, or do you want to come through Boaz to the house of bread and praise? to the worship of God's race. Every member of Adam's ruined race can refuse this if you want, like Orpah, and cleverly choose to die. Or you can come, like Ruth did, to the Redeemer that God's placed for us, which is a thousand times greater than Boaz, into life and love and liberty and fullness. This is a wonderful, wonderful story, Ruth. Father, thanks for today, and thanks for the illustration, and thanks what you did in my life and almost everybody's life in here, and help those who haven't decided yet to choose you this day, to choose God's provision through the Lord Jesus Christ unto a new name, a new life, a new hope, a new family, a new home in heaven, uh, all through the relationship with that man, the Lord Jesus. Amen.